Okay, we're glad to know that you're still there. Uh, remember that currencies change. Uh, its impact on financial issues in the country is what we are discussing right now. And joining us to do this conversation is Mr. Shegun Sokwiton, Principal Partner, Woodridge and Scott Consulting. Hello and welcome to the program, Mr. Shokwiton. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Okay, uh, well... Today, we were expecting the president to unveil the new Naira notes. Um, maybe it has been done, but we haven't had that information. Uh, we're wondering how you would react to this sudden change of date for unveiling the new Naira, at least more than 20 days to mm -hmm. the proposed date of unveiling the new Naira notes. Yeah, it's, um, it, was, it came as a, a bit of a surprise. But then when you also... Um, think about the wider implications of um, this policy and perhaps the objectives of the policy. You, 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 you know, you sort of realize maybe it's not such a big surprise after all. Um, so th there are economic um, considerations for, for this policy for doing this, and then there are political considerations. And um, it will seem as though there is quite a bit of uh, pressure, political pressure, on the central bank to shift ground on this policy. And you would have heard the CBN governor allude to that. Uh, in fact, he was very emphatic in the way he addressed that issue. He insisted that they were not going to shift the deadline, <laughs> um, the January 31st deadline, when the old currency would no longer be legal tender. Um, so I, I think that what perhaps has happened is um, as a way of a bit of shifting ground, um, they have um, increased the concurrence window. You know, so bef before now, the, the number of days that the two currencies would have run um, in parallel with each other was about 60, you know, uh, 45 days. Um, and I think all they've done now is just increase that window uh, to roughly a bit over 60 days. So hopefully it won't have too much of an impact on the overall um, success of, of the policy. But it, will, it would appear as though this is just um, politicians trying to buy some time. But I was expecting, or some of us were expecting, that if he has to shift ground, it would be the direct um, request that was made by some quarters that it should be shifted forward, like the end date for uh, the use of the old Naira notes, as it were, should be shifted from that date that he set it in January, uh, that is the 31st of January. But now he, he brought forward the unveiling. I don't know, how, how has that impacted, or how will that impact on this whole process? How will it make it better? Because it seems like it is more sudden now. I don't seem to understand. Well, it's no longer sudden if you realize that, you know, the cat is out of the bag. Um, the, the weapon, in quote, that the CBN has had uh, has been the element of surprise. Um, and um, that element of surprise is no longer there. From the moment that this policy was announced uh, last month, it became clear that this, this is what was going to happen. And um, the responses, the reactions, and all of that, from especially from the politicians, if you remember the very heated debates that happened on the floor of the National Assembly over this matter, you realize that uh, politicians are not finding this funny at all. Um, so that politicians, the political class in particular, now know that this is happening. Um, and, I, and obviously what has happened now is that the central bank has now increased the window during which... Um, the swapping is allowed because with as soon as you've unveiled, then the new notes become legal tender, and then you can start sending in your old notes um, so that you can start collecting the new ones. Even though it would appear as though the collecting of the new ones may not have been triggered immediately, but I would imagine that 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 time frame also would would, would shift. You have to understand that the CBN is really, really under pressure over this. There are people that want this policy reversed. Um, so I'm particularly pleased that this, the central bank governor, I'm not a fan of his by any stretch of the imagination, uh, but on this one, I am 100% in his, in, in his corner. 
and um, we have been urging that he must stand his ground, the CBM must stand his ground, and not shift ground on this policy. They must implement it, and for me, I'm not even happy that they've shifted at all, this little shift, you know, because it gives a bit of an advantage to the, the people that this, this policy is targeted at primarily. All right. Uh, initially, when the announcement was made about the redesigning of the NARA, what part of the reasons that was given by the Apex Bank is how that, you know, a, a great percentage of the NARA, you know, already printed and in existence are outside the quarters of the banks. Uh, most of them are outside. We don't know where they are. And, you mm -hmm. know, they claim that this redesign would help uh, manage the Naira in circulation and, you know, manage how money flows in and out of the banks. How do you think that redesigning the Naira will be able to help them achieve this? You know, so, so what, what, what tends to happen because um, of the uh, peculiarities of, of the Nigerian economy, um, um, our economy is, um, some would say, 50-50 uh, between the formal and the informal economy, informal sectors. Um, some would even argue that the informal sector is far bigger than the formal sector. So what that does from a policy-making point of view is that a lot of transactions are happening that are simply not accounted for. You know, that it's, it's, not, it's not going through the banking system at all. And if it's not going through the banking system and you have um, huge volumes of cash, um, being used to initiate and complete transactions. A lot of those transactions slip through the cracks. In fact, you can no longer call them the cracks. They fall through huge holes um, in the data gathering um, um, system of, 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 the, of the government. So with that, you, you cannot plan adequately. If you are planning and you're saying that, for example, that um, uh, your GDP um, for example, is $500 uh, billion. <clears throat> An informal economy means that possibly your GDP is double that. That's one of the, that, that's one of the implications. So what the CBN is simply trying to do is to bring in all of these transactions into the formal sector. So if you mop up the cash, so the primary objective of this policy is to bring the cash outside of the banking system into the banking system so that you know transactions can then be monitored tracked planned for and you know policy making can be more accurate um so it's a from that perspective it's a very good policy and um ultimately it will succeed you know the challenge is that um the people that are responsible for a significant chunk of the cash that is outside of the banking system will resume their antics as soon as the new currency is unveiled and we, will, we may find ourselves back at this same uh, um, junction um, in another three to four years you know so which is why you find that in some climes currency redesign happens as, as frequently as every five years frequently as every four years you know it's a very expensive pro project so ordinarily it's something you don't want to do too frequently but when you have um, a segment of society um, determined to undermine your, 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 your economic planning, your national planning, um, you know, um, uh, uh, monetary policy planning and all of that, um, then you may, you may want to um, look at the pros and cons and do this more frequently. And I think that's what the CBN is doing now. So I wouldn't be surprised if you have a new CBN governor coming and also do this in another three three and a half years, because the, the, the volume of cash outside of the banking system will, will, will begin to grow again as soon as this exercise is uh, completed. All right. Uh, just a follow up from, you know, what you said, because you mentioned how that, you know, the whole process of redesigning the currencies is quite expensive. Uh, can you take us, you know, through the cost implication or what it will cost Nigeria to have this redesign done? Um, the CBN, it, 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 there, was a, there was an infographic that was um, um, shared publicly and uh, the cost is somewhere around um, about, uh, it's, it's a lot of money. We're talking about, about 600 billion naira, you know, to, because what you are doing is you are practically changing your entire, you know, the, the, the currency. 
So you are printing um, uh, millions and millions of new notes, you know. And remember, um, these notes are not ordinary paper. There's a lot of security features that are in, uh, included. There is um, um, hologram, hologram stickers. There is um, 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 see-through transparent tapes. You know, so many different types of features that are embedded in this currency, in addition to the fact that, in fact, the currency is no longer ordinary paper. Uh, people are suggesting to the CBN, we don't know what they would do. Obviously, they are keeping it a secret, uh, but that most likely, even the higher denominations will probably be polymer rather than paper-based, you know, which would make it significantly more expensive. So we're talking um, in the hundred, hundreds of billions range as being the cost of this exercise. So clearly, it's 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 a cost you you can't um, afford to carry um, too frequently on, on terms of uh, the impact on on on, on government finance. Um, but but if you look at the potential benefits, then clearly, um, I think that the benefits far outweigh 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 the costs, and the policy must must be pursued and seen through to a logical conclusion. How confident are you about the entire process in light of the fact that, um, uh, okay, it's understandable that um, some people who are storing money, for instance, in septic tanks and other places that only God knows where, um, it's understandable if you say the target is for these people. But in Nigerian society, we still have a chunk of people who are doing legitimate business and it's either they do not have faith in the banking system or they don't even have access to this banking uh, system and all that. Maybe because they're illiterate or maybe because of where they, they, they live. How confident are you in this whole process that it will not deprive some people of their hard-earned money? Because we we're just telling a story here before this program, how some people are calling some of us uh, in the townships, uh, so to speak, to ask us whether it is even true that this money is going to be changed, which means the information has not even gone around. So do you think the um, CBN th thought it through to come up with this policy, factoring in this kind of people who may not have access to the banking system? Yeah, when, um, you know, the... the, the um the press statement that the CBN gave out yesterday, or you know, this, the 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 press briefing that he did yesterday, he actually spoke about this. So clearly, they've thought about it. Um, whether uh, the time is enough is is um, is debatable, um, and uh, I I suspect that we will find out uh, soon enough. Uh, so one of the things I think that the CBN hasn't done enough of at all is to run. Um, a, 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 a very um, a big enough camp, public information campaign about this. Because you are right, there are people in the hinterland who who may who may not um, have heard about this. But having said that, I think it's also important to note that um, it is very very likely that after even after the expiration, don't forget. What would happen is the the old notes will cease to be legal tender, right? So you can't spend them, you can't use it to um, transact business anywhere. But I would imagine that the CBM may want to um, allow banks to continue to mop those old notes up, um, even after the expiration of the deadline uh, for when those notes will cease to be legal tender, which will be January 30th. That thirty-first, you know, because if the CBM finds uh, by virtue of data gathering, for example, by virtue of the volume of cash that came back into the system as a result of this, that there is still a, a, a significant portion out um, out out in the wind, then they may need to extend that deadline for um, depositing the old notes. So it, the note will no longer be legal tender very clearly. But I don't see too much of damage that can be caused if the CBN allows those old notes to continue to come back in. Uh, and I say this because, for example, there's the concept of mutilated notes. Um, you know, so there's a certain um, 
extent of damage that your currency notes in particular would have suffered that would make them to cease to be legal tender. They can't be accepted, you know, in the course of exchange of um, goods and services. But banks are allowed to collect them because the banks can collect them and serve as an extension of the CBN um, in withdrawing them from circulation and getting them, you know, destroyed as the CBN's mandate provides. So I don't think there's anything wrong if after January 31st, the CBN continues to um, allow people to bring the old notes in. What you can't do is you can't spend that money anywhere else. So people that get caught in the crossfire, so to speak, because they didn't have um, the information about this may still may not end up losing uh, the value in that currency. I, I don't think if they lose that money, the economy loses as well because that's value. Okay, um, I think he, the internet won't let us continue talking to uh, him, but he made a point. And one question I would have wanted to ask him is. Are you there? Can you hear us? Well, oh, okay. There are, there, are, there are lots of questions to ask. We thought we had lost your audio there. Let, let, let me just, before yes. I, I forget, um, maybe it's a bit of a digression, but this thing we're talking about is Naira notes, like paper money. And it is not long ago that we were talking about a cashless economy and then there was the e-Naira that was launched. Mm. It didn't raise as much dust as the Naira or the paper money is raising now. Do you think the e-Naira has any significant role to play in our economy? Was it even important to launch that e-Naira when in our country now the in thing is still the paper money? The, can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, okay, we can great. hear you. So as far as the Inara, you know, yeah, the Inara um, um, project is concerned, uh, this, remember the Inara is digital currency, it's digital Naira. Um, um, it, it, it doesn't speak particularly to this. With or without this policy, the Inara policy was something that uh, would, was going to happen at some point. Uh, simply because of uh, increasing of cryptocurrencies globally, you know, so we're getting to a point in the global economy where cryptocurrencies are beginning to become means of exchange of transactions in regular day-to-day -day dealings, including to the up to the point where you can now have ATM cards issued to you. In you know, with a, the, based on cryptocurrency, so you can actually transact uh, business on the web and pay with crypto using your card, using your card number. So, so the the, the primary objective of of um, of uh, it keeps breaking. It's, it's skipping. You know, the audio. Hello, Mr. Shokwaton. Okay. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I okay, can hear you now. Okay, so it doesn't speak to the cashless policy. It doesn't speak to um, it doesn't speak to um, online electronic transfers and all of that. It's simply moving the naira into the world of crypto, and I think that's where that stops. So the success of that is still, you know, it's obviously adoption rate is very low because primarily um, crypto adoption generally is still is still is still a bit of a niche niche market. A lot of people, I mean, if I ask, you know, the three of us that are having this conversation, we probably don't have never transacted in crypto. You know, uh, if you ask uh, one out of 10 people on the road, most of them haven't had any kind, they just hear about it, oh, crypto, 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 but who has actually done, um, you know, gone ahead to buy cryptocurrency and has investments in it and all that. It's still a bit of an elitist thing for now, you know, so so that's why the adoption of the inner appears to be slow, but it will pick up because cryptos are becoming, like I said before, more and more prevalent. All right. Uh, during the press conference yesterday with the governor of the CBN, but one of the things he said is that in the light of emerging trends, it had become appropriate to develop a currency that was 
you know, that would be a legal tender that would be able to play in the digital economy space. Uh, does this mean that what we had before, the narratives that we had before, wouldn't or were not able to play favorably in the digital economy space? Well, um, fiat currency is fiat currency, printed money is printed money, and I am not sure I see a convergence uh, between printed money and um, the digital space. If you, if you include within that digital space blockchain and crypto. Um, if, however, by digital space you mean, for example, um, just electronic transfers, POS transactions, even if, even if that's what you're talking about, Printed money is printed money. So, except if the CBN governor is perhaps alluding to the possibility that it's, you know, you can scan the new Naira notes <laughs> or something like that and um, have its value transferred as a result of that. Uh, I don't see the correlation between, um, you know, the redesign of the currency um, and the, the, the digital economy. Maybe as the new features of the currency becomes obvious, what he said might make sense, but for now, for me, I don't. I'm not sure I know what exactly um, he was talking about. Okay, uh, how how much confidence do you have in the banking system generally? I, I did mention earlier on that some people might be having their money in their pillows just because they have no uh, confidence in the banking system. But what is your assessment of the banking system in Nigeria? Whether it is their charges, whether it's their services, whether it's their interest rate, whatever it is, how confident are you in them? Or if you're not, what areas do you think do they need to grow? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure the problem is, you know, the confidence of somebody like me. I mean, I'm a stakeholder in the banking industry. Um, I've, I've worked there for decades. I still have um, interests there at the moment. So um, it's not about me. I think it's about the confidence of the public mm. in the banking system and um, the evidence of how high or how low that level of confidence in is, is in the financial inclusion um, um, ratio. And um, as far as the last report, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we have a financial inclusion ratio of about 55%, 55% of, of Nigerian adults having one form of banking um, account or the other, one form of, yeah, let's, let's, let's call it that. So whether, whether you're talking of um, um, mobile money, for example, or you're talking of just traditional banking accounts, um, about 55% of Nigerian adults are now in that space. Now that's very low uh, when you compare to other parts of the world where percentages are as high as 70, 80 percent. Um, and the reason for that, you know, and that's even an improvement on where we were just about 10 years ago, when inclusion was as low as 35 percent. So there has been consistent in improvement in this um, as a result of, you know, some of the products and services that the banks have been bringing, you know, into play as a result of um, the, uh, the uh, um, um, entry of mobile phone operators into that space and as a result of some policies of the CBN, for example, the cashless economy policy. But having said that, uh, the banking industry has a long way to go in terms of winning the confidence of the average man on the street. Um, uh, that, I think, goes without gain saying. Whether you want to talk about the issue of charges, you know, people, when you have a public that believes that I put my money in a bank, and I just leave it there, the money will reduce in value over time. Then you have a problem. Then people would keep their money away from the bank, especially the um, not so educated and maybe the illiterate. Um, so if, if, if I believe that if I put in uh, 1,000 naira into the bank and then when I want to take my 1,000 naira back, I, I get um, less than 1,000 naira because the bank will take some charges off me, then there's a problem. Um, so for example, the, 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 this thing we call we used to call COT in Nigeria, which the central bank tried to eliminate, but then now introduced the account maintenance charge, which is exactly what a commission on turnover is. is an, an aberration. It's, 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 a, it's, a, 
is a is a is a financial chart that doesn't exist anywhere in the world. It's a Nigerian thing, you know. And you know, there is no justification for you charging me for withdrawing money from my account, the same money that I paid into my account, when I know that when I give you that money, you're going to trade with it and make money from it. So why are you charging me for it? You know, so and that chart continues to exist. So any business person, a small business, medium scale business owner who values, who understands the importance of the time value of money, will not put their money in, in the bank just for this reason alone. And there are so many other issues. There's the issue of COT, there's the issue of the high uh, fees and charges. There is the poor, very, very poor service delivery standards in the banking industry. You put your money in the bank and you want to go make a withdrawal, you go to the banking hall and you meet, meet those snake queues. You know those snake queues, the queues that run and, and they form an S within the banking hall and sometimes will overflow the banking hall onto the streets, you know? Those types of things will discourage people from being, bringing their money to the bank. And I think the banking industry really, really needs to look, have a very um, hard look at the service delivery standards and pay more attention to how the customer feels about their services. And financial inclusion will improve. Right now, it's, it's really, it leaves a lot to be desired. Kind of impunity, they are, they are working. They are working for themselves and doing what they please at any time that uh, they want to. Because if the CBN tried to um, abolish the COT, for instance, or some other charges, and they still are existing, uh, where do we run to as, as people? How can we hold the banks uh, to this kind of responsibility that they, should, that they owe us as the individuals? Are we, are we going to say that it's a lost cause or there is still hope? No, it's not a lost cause. We have to continue to advocate. We have to continue to talk about these issues. For example, um, the, the uh, Federal Consumer Protection um, and Competition um, Council, FCCPC, um, um, is, is one tool that I think Nigerians have not used enough. Um, I, I am personally aware of how passionate, you know, the head of that, the director general of that, um, a government agency is about quality of service. I've had interactions with them um, in the past, and I know that they take up these complaints. Um, so some of these service issues that we have or complaints we have about charges, we can take them to the FCCPC, um, and they will, you will get a response. Another um, instrument that is available um, or mechanism that is available is the Central Bank's um, Consumer Complaints Department, the CPD. Uh, consumer protection department they're also quite responsive if you have any problem with any of the nigerian banks bordering on service failures you know um, illegal charges and what have you you do an email to that bank and copy cpd at send i, I think it's cbn.gov now um, you can you can google just go to google and you can get that email address and you send an email to them the cpd always responds and the banks are very wary of being reported to the CPD, you know. So there are things that the Nigerian public can do to uh, keep the banks on their toes and get them to, you know, do better as far as service provision, um, service quality standards uh, is concerned. We can't give up. We, we can't just throw our hands up and um, and uh, in the in the belief that there is there is no hope. There is always hope, and there is always something that can be done. In the course of this conversation, you've mentioned a couple of implications that you know would come with this uh, Naira redesign. Uh, part of the conversations that that had come up in the last two days is how that the CBN has increased the interest rate to 16.5 percent from what it used to be at 15.5 percent to stem inflation. And of course, the CBN hopes raising rates will reduce money supply in the economy and rein in inflation. Do you think that? That, you know this is a good step or do Nigerians face the risk of you know having a slowing economic growth and do you think actually this redesign is, has any implication or is going to affect or change the inflation that we are in right now actually one of the um, objectives that the CBN governor did um, list out when they announced the redesign was exactly this issue of money supply um, and the impact of inflation. 
and the, the idea being that there's simply so much cash out there that is um, com that is actually driving um, inflationary uh, forces upwards. Um, so, so yes, in that sense, um, uh, the the redesign, the narrow, the currency redesign project would definitely have an impact on money supply. Um, cash being one of the types of money that is in the economy, flowing in the economy. Um, uh, but uh, increasing the, the, the MPR to 16.5, um, I'm, I'm beginning to get a bit worried about this uh, because I, I think that there is only so high that you can go in terms of um, interest rates without impacting access to credit and therefore productivity of the economy. Um, so it, it's always a balancing act by the CBN and by the NPC, the Monetary Policy Committee. They always, it's, it's always a consideration, trying to strike that balance between reigning in inflation and triggering a recession or slowing growth down. Um, I, I would have thought that at 15.5, they would have stopped. I would have, oh. My expectation was that this NPC meeting would have recommend um, a hold um, policy, which is you don't increase, you don't reduce. Um, so I'm a bit surprised that they've gone a hundred basis points up again. Um, of course, this is going to drive interest rates up. This is going to make credit more expensive to the people that need it the most, and which would have, have an impact on the cost of production, um, on the cost of production of goods, manufactured goods, and on the cost of uh, access to services that are, um, you know, in critical demand. Within the within the economy, and therefore it will drive, it will drive uh, you know invariably. You know, there are economic experts who will tell you that increasing interest rates is perhaps not necessarily a solution to stopping inflation, especially when the inflation that we're dealing with might not necessarily be um, driven from a monetary policy point of view. There could also be the cost push push issue, the the structural and logistic issues that are we know are behind some of these inflationary pressures that we're seeing right now. Um, the war in Ukraine, for example, the, the, the crisis in the north, northeast that has extended way beyond the northeast into north central and the northwest where a lot of our food comes from. Mm. And the fact that, you know, food supply has been impacted negatively, which is driving the prices of food, food, food up. How does increasing uh, monetary policy rates improve the supply of food? You know, so so I think that for me, the CBN should will need at this point to 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 pause on this continued. This is the fourth consecutive price increase by the NPC. You know, and and that's that's alarming. I think it's about time that they put a pause on this and let the government use other policy instruments. You know, to 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 address the structural um, uh, uh, causes of inflation beyond the monetary policy issues. Uh, so, so it's something that we, we all need to be worried about. Okay, just finally, because um, we've run out of time, but very quickly now, uh, some projections from the international bodies have said that um, we are going to face a lot of hunger, like from next year. And even another one, another report has said that soon, if the government doesn't act very fast, 250 Nigerians will become poor. I mean, right now, the population is not even up to 250 million, but they're already projecting that 250 million will soon be very, very poor in Nigeria uh, in the nearest future. That means virtually everybody will become poor in Nigeria. But do you believe these uh, projections, these statistics that are being churned out by the international organizations that, like the United Nations and all that uh, about Nigeria? judging from the economy that we are facing? Well, yes, we, we have to take a lot of those things with a pinch of salt. Um, uh, there, there is um, uh, economic policy, there are economic ideas and economic theories, yes. Um, um, and then there is a um, practical reality on ground in Nigeria. And I think that the duty of every government um, must be to strike a very delicate balance between those two things to ensure that the common good is best served. You know, so, so some of these uh, statistics that 
um, these uh, international bodies and organizations, especially the lending, the international lending institutions, the World Bank, the, the IFC, you know, and all of those, those people. When they say these things, we have to understand that there is an agenda. Um, this is very, very important. We have to understand that there is an agenda. Um, um, it's called, there's something called enlightened self-interest. Whose interest precisely is the World Bank serving? Whose interest is the IFC serving? Um, are they serving our interests? Are they really genuinely interested in uh, the, the economic growth and development of Africa? Will that serve the interest of the Western economies or would, 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 would some of the benefits that they are getting from our being in the situation we are in uh, will, will cease? So when they say these things, yes, there may be some truth, there may be some wisdom. I'm not saying we should throw them all out the window, but we have to be very careful about what we believe. For example, they are also in that same statement you, you refer to, they are, they're talking about the issue of subsidies, fuel subsidies, subsidies, subsidies for the power industry, and a lot of other subsidies that exist, you know, in our economy today. And they're saying, you know, those subsidies have to go. We know that they have to go. We know the impact these things have on, uh, on the, on the uh, fiscal, you know, uh, side of the, the equation, on the ability of the government to finance um, a lot of things that, that need attention. But you cannot remove subsidies just like that because the impact on the standard of living on the lives of nigerians will be swift and will be and will be grievous you know so if the government wants to take subsidies out there has to be a process there has to be it's it's got to be well planned and well programmed um so it's it's good for the imf and the world bank to say these things but uh, our government must be responsible about how they take those 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 information and the data and you know, the statistics in and use them to ensure that Nigerian citizens will suffer more. Um, if the government follows some of the prescriptions of the IMF and the World Bank, then the prophecy of the World Bank that Niger all Nigerians will become poor might well become a self-fulfilling prophecy because we listen to them. So the, the way not to end up fulfilling that prophecy is to take some of the things that they're saying with a pinch of salt. Thank you, Mr. Shokpeton, for coming on the show. The new Naira notes, by the way, are out already, and um, people have had the privilege to see them. Uh, we'll just go on to uh, show you some of these Naira notes, and then uh, you'll have a feel. But, Mr. Shokpeton, we are so grateful that you were able to make it to the program today. Thank you so much for being a part of the program. Thanks for having me. Pleasure being here. Have a nice day. You too. So as Nigerians, we watch this and see what the new Naira notes look like. There's not much of a difference. There is. <laughs> the not... color difference. <laughs> Why is 200 Naira looking red? Well, it's red on one corner, <laughs> green on one corner. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, the good thing about the new Naira notes is that we will all have them in mint. It's a well, long time. Yeah, that we before you start me. having yeah, yeah. the torn notes, <laughs> okay. the old notes, and the dirty ones. Yes, as we enjoy the sights of this, we are going to take a break immediately afterwards, and then we'll take the news. After the news, we'll be back with some newspaper headlines and just um, uh, wrap it up with that. Stay with us.